But before I get going on what I want to talk about today, you know, we had a lot going on last week. It was Easter. It was my first Sunday back after 10 and a half months overseas. And it was the Sunday that I introduced you to my new wife. So there were several things that uh, I had to talk about. But uh, there's one other thing that I'd like to say that um, I wanted to put in its proper place. And that is, even though she's not here today, I'd like to thank Reverend Terry for filling in for me while I was gone. And, um, you know, the board and I had wanted to, you know, honor her and, and maybe like, give her a plaque or whatever it is um, publicly. And she said, you know, no, I really don't feel like I want to do that. But if folks would like to send me a card, you know, or a little note or something, that would be fine. So Terry's address is online on Realm, which is our church management system that you guys all have access to if you, you know, ha actually responded to your invitation. I still have several invitations that have not been responded to, but um, if you have problems getting into Realm, you can always call the church office and Jolie will be glad to give you Terry's address and you can send her a, a thank you card. I sent her off something, a little, a little something, something this week, uh, which I hope she's enjoying. But uh, it, this this church absolutely relied on those people who showed up while I was gone, and, and she certainly showed up. So I just wanted to honor her for that, even if she didn't want, you know, something formal. So uh, if you get a chance, you know, tell Terry thank you or send her a, a quick little card or a note and let her know how much we love her. So thank you. So <clears throat> it, today's subject is something that it actually contains two things that scare people a lot. I'm talking about having and making and living a commitment to change. And commitment scares people and so does change. Some people are so averse to change that they would rather die than change. And I have a little story I'll, I'll tell you. How many people remember Harry Truman? Okay, Not Harry S. Truman, but Harry R. Truman. Right? Harry S. Truman was the president. Harry R. Truman. Harry R. Truman was a uh, cantankerous old fellow who lived by a lake that used to be at the foot of Mount St. Helens. The volcano in Washington State, which erupted in May of 1980. Now, in the, uh, those, for those of us who remember it, um, it in the lead-up time, it was very obvious that Mount St. Helens was about to erupt. I mean, the geologists were all saying, this thing is going to blow. Uh, it wasn't like a there's a 10% chance or a 30% chance. If, if you remember, they were saying, this thing's going to blow and it's going to be pretty spectacular. And so they issued an evacuation order for that part of the state. And uh, Harry wasn't going anywhere. Um, he, he, he was kind of a... a uh, he, he marched to his own drummer. He actually grew up in uh, the state I grew up in, West Virginia. He, he was born in Clay County, West Virginia. And he'd been out there on the edge of that lake for about 50 years. He had a lodge there, and he had lived there, and he had buried his wife there, and he wasn't going anywhere. So he, he kind of became something of a minor celebrity there for a couple months, and uh, news people would take a chopper in, and they would talk to him and interview him, and he, he, so he was colorful, let's say, as some of us from West Virginia are from time to time. So on May 18th, 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted, and Harry Truman died. They never found his body. His cabin lies buried under 150 feet of volcanic rubble. Miriam's nodding her head up and down. She's like, yep, yep, yep. And you wonder, why is someone so averse to change that they're willing to die over? But it happens all the time, and it, being afraid of change is really a part of being human. And it goes back into the way that we are wired, the way our brains work. We have uh, a portion of our brain in the sort of pseudoscientific explanation of the brain, the triune brain. There's three, three major parts in that explanation. We're talking about the reptilian brain, and in particular, the reticular activating system, which is a little part of your brain that exists from the top of your spinal cord up about two inches and is a little thicker than a pencil. And it's a very useful piece of equipment in our brains because what it does is it takes all the millions and bajillions 
of pieces of input data that our nervous systems are constantly bombarding our brain with, and it tries to filter them down to the ones that matter. And in our old brains, it was the ones that could get us eaten, right? If something is different, something has changed, then it might be dangerous, right? If we've been standing out there on the savanna or in the jungle or wherever it was that we happen to be, and suddenly there's a different shadow under that tree, right? Got to notice that. Might be dangerous. So kind of hardwired into the base of our brain is this underlying idea that different is dangerous. And it affects the way that we look at change. And even though we have advanced from beyond just having a little teeny brain stem and we have all this, you know, other brain material that does all these neat things like write sonatas and, and you know, build rocket ships, it's still working on us. In uh, November 2010, a study showed that people have a very reliable and tangible preference for things that have been around longer. All right? And what they did was they set this study up and said to people, okay, here's this thing, whatever it is. And it, they, they used examples from the requirements for a college course to acupuncture, a piece of art, and even chocolate. And they would tell people, like one group, they would say, okay, this course has been run this way for 100 years. And then they would tell another group, this very same course curriculum is brand new. We just made it up. And the majority of people liked the one that had been around longer. Same, same thing with acupuncture. Same thing with chocolate. Same thing with art. It's crazy. Older is better. And I think that part of that is based in our ego is this underlying fear of failure. New things might fail, old things They've been around, they've been proven to be successful. And just a kind of quick note on failure, because we all fail from time to time, is, you know, failure is part of life. But if you don't fail, you don't learn. Some of you may have seen a, a quick little Will Smith video. If you haven't, um, you can find it on Facebook or you probably just Google it. And uh, he talks about failure and he says that there's, it's important to fail in three ways, to fail early, to fail often, and to fail forward. And he says that it's absolutely essential for us to push ourselves to the point of failure because it's at that point change happens and growth happens. And he uses the example of when you're working out. You want to work out until your muscles fail, right? There are so many people who have become tremendous successes who failed over and over and over again. And, you know, we've all heard a lot of different examples of Abraham Lincoln lost, uh, you know, a bunch of elections before he became the president. Albert Einstein couldn't speak until he was four years old, and he uh, failed what were essentially his country's, um, not ASVABs, that's the armed forces, um, the uh, college interest, the ACT, or the, um, what's the other one? SAT, right? Albert Einstein failed those, trying to get into college. Couldn't do it. Bill, da uh, Bill Gates, the very first invention that he came up with, it was called Trafo Data. He did this when he was 17 years old. And it was designed to take data from traffic monitoring devices and to automatically tabulate it rather than having people have to hand jam it in manually. When he went to go sell it to the uh, Seattle Traffic Authority, it just would not work at all. Failed completely. Bill Gates. J.K. Rowling, most of you have heard her story. She was a single mom on welfare when uh, she wrote the Harry Potter books, and they were refused by the first dozen publishers that she sent Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, which was Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, in England when she was first trying to sell it. Can you imagine being the reader at one of those publishing houses who turned those books down? Right? But the point is, is that there, we have to challenge ourselves. If we're going to change, we cannot let that fear of failure make us say, you know what, it's just not worth it. Um, since I've been back, I've started working out with my wife. 
And I, you know, I, I normally worked out anyway, but not with kind of the, uh, the intensity that, that she goes after it. She runs marathons and um, does this stuff called P90X. For anybody that's familiar with that, right? It's some real skinny people from Los Angeles who are a bunch of sadists and masochists. You know, so uh, I, I'm trying to keep up with her. And they're doing all these things on the screen. And it's like, how are you making your body do this? You know, it's like, and I, I will fall over from time to time. And, you know, but the idea is I, I always want to try to fall over a little less often or, you know, look pretzely a little better by the end of each one of those 30-second intervals. And you know you're in real trouble when the guy says, oh, you're going to like this next one. I don't think so. But you know what Laura said uh, to me a couple days ago was if it doesn't challenge you, it won't change you. And that is absolutely the truth. The thing about change, and you know, I know I was talking about people like Bill Gates and Abraham Lincoln, but each and every one of us has the ability to make changes in our own lives that are important, important to us. Doesn't mean that we're gonna turn into a billionaire or become president of the United States, but it doesn't mean that the, the effort that we put in is unimportant. And uh, we've got a video that I want to show you about a person who realized she needed to make a change in her life and you know what she did and kind of the effects that it had. I've always been a big girl. Most people in my family are big, and it was never an issue. In 2008, I had a health scare. I started having pains in my chest. They were uh, sharp, very, very intense. I didn't know if I was having a heart attack. It turned out that I wasn't, but the doctors in the ER told me point blank that I needed to change my lifestyle or I wasn't gonna live to see my son grow up. I knew exactly what I had to do. I knew that it would involve running, so that's what I did. Today I'll do one mile, tomorrow I'll try to do one and a half miles, and then 5Ks led to 10Ks, and then half marathons. And in those first couple of months, I lost 27 pounds. I do marathons, ultra marathons. The longest race I've ever run was 100K which is 62 miles. I have a blog called Fat Girl Running. I started it because I just wanted to share what I was experiencing as a runner in a big body. People say things to me like, you're a big girl, are you sure you should be running? And so I wrote about those things and it seemed to resonate with a lot of people. En la poesía tenemos esto. I'm a teacher, that's my job. I'm also the head coach of the varsity cross country team. I think most people who are my size in athletic pursuit. There is a joy in what we do and we love to spread that joy. And she's actually taking that same gift and started making a difference in the lives of kids. She's become, she was a teacher and she's now become the coach of her school's cross country team. And those kind of things happen all around us if we look for them. I know in my own life, I see tremendous change in the lives of people uh, who have gone into sobriety. I can't tell you what it means to see someone crawl into the rooms of recovery, someone who is broken, someone who is literally at death's door, and watch what happens. They may never become someone rich or famous, but they become themselves again. And they do it largely through a spiritual transformation. If we are here to do anything, you know, if we're here in this church to do anything, I think it's, it's for each of us to do a spiritual transformation, to, to take a look within and to realize, you know, there's more to us than meets the eye, that, that that Christ spirit is a part of who we are, and that some of those things that may have been eating our lunch are, are not quite so important and not quite so big after all. Both Jesus and Paul, and I, I normally quote Jesus and not Paul, but both of them 
nodded to that spiritual transformation. Last week, um, I talked about Jesus saying, if you really want to follow me, you know, you got to pick up your cross. And I, I was quoting from Mark, but I also mentioned that Luke talks about doing it daily. And I wanted to read you that this week. So this is from the ninth chapter of the book of Luke, and it's verses uh, 23 through 28. And it begins, Then he said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. So he's not talking about everybody doing a one-time crash and burn like what happened to him. He's talking about making a lifestyle out of this, denying ourselves daily and taking up our crosses and following him. It says, For those that want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will save it. And you think about uh, old Harry trying to hang on to the life that he had. And I think about how many of us have tried to hang on to a thing, to anything from a marriage to a job to a possession, hanging on to our wealth. And in the end, it's that hanging on that does us in, the way it did Harry. And Jesus makes it very specific. He goes on and says, What does it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit themselves? As we look around our culture today, that becomes clearer and clearer all the time. Those who are ashamed of me and of my words, of them the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Apparently, Jesus had people telling him he was too political too. But truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. In other words, some of you guys are going to get this. I know that you will. I have faith that you will. Some of you are going to understand what the real deal is, and you will live in the kingdom of God. And so it is for us today. Some of you sitting here will not taste death before you know the kingdom of God, and I hope it's all of us. I hope it's each and every one of us. Paul put it a little differently, and this is a pretty famous quote it's from Romans the 12th chapter, the second verse. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have to change our minds first, but then we have to go out and change our world. And what that requires is commitment. We are not going to change our minds without making a commitment. And we are not going to change the world without committing to it. I was looking for some definitions of commitment, and I really loved this one. From, of all people, Martina Navratilova, the tennis player. The difference between involvement and commitment is like ham and eggs. The chicken is involved. The pig is committed. Right? Just got a point there. And then when we think about being spiritual students, um, I like to go back to the master, Master Yoda. And he says, a Jedi must have the deepest commitment, the most serious mind. This one a long time have I watched. All his life has he looked away to the future, to the horizon, never his mind on where he was what he was doing. Hmm. Adventure. <laughs> Excitement. <laughs> A Jedi craves not these things. And he's got a real point there. Commitment's about what I'm doing right now, not about where I may be 10 years from now. Now, I may be committed to an idea that will take me to there, but I have to be living it right here, right now, today. And that kind of goes back and echoes our our fifth principle, 
You know, it's not enough just to know this stuff. It's not enough to understand it. We've got to be living it. We have to be acting it every day, each and every day. Some of you may remember the keys to the kingdom. How many people were here when we did that? Okay. Anybody remember the first key? I'll probably do this again next year because it's such a great series and it'll help some of you. Remember, the first key to the kingdom, the keys to the kingdom is a uh, prosperity series from David Owen Ritz. And it's, it's just really good. Um, it's good teaching. But the first key of the seven keys to the kingdom was making a commitment. And the, the full key was making a commitment to being a giver to life. And one of the practices that uh, you, you, you do when you're going through the keys to the kingdom is you make a seven-week commitment to tithe of your time, your talent, and your treasure. That is, you, your tithing of your time was four hours a week spent in spiritual practice. And tithing of your talent was giving of your week to some place where you know you use your own talents with no expectation of giving it you know getting anything in return and then tithing your treasure is you know, tithing to where you're spiritually fed we had a question from our wednesday night class this week that i thought was pretty germane to the issue is what do i need to do for a program of spiritual development and how do i build my faith which is something that enables us to commit and those things that we we did when we committed to being a giver to life are exactly what I say. And we, we need to tithe of our time. That is, we need to spend time in spiritual practice. We need to pray, meditate, journal, you know, read spiritual writings, you know, come to Sunday, um, adult spiritual education, come to church. I applaud all of you who came the week after Easter, right? That's two weeks in a row for some of you. And, uh, you know, in, in, in America, regular church going has kind of shrunk a little bit. So I, I appreciate all of you being here this Sunday. That's, that's dedication. That's commitment. So we need to not only commit to our own spiritual growth, and we do, because that's where it all begins. But if there's anything that I could say is sort of a black mark against our denomination is that we have a tendency to become a bunch of navel gazers. We turn inward. You know, we, we, we get very own money, pod me home, and we, you know, get into the lotus position, and we say namaste. But we have to get out and become involved and, and be part of our community. You know, so when we think about what happens to churches, they can become stubborn and die just like Harry did. So I want to read you a little story. I knew the patient before she died. It was 10 years ago. She was very sick at the time, but she did not want to admit it. There was only a glimmer of hope at best, but that hope could become a reality only with radical change. She wasn't nearly ready for that change. Indeed, she was highly resistant to any change, even though she was very sick, even though she was dying. I told her the bad news bluntly, you are dying. I hope I said those words with some compassion. I did feel badly sharing the news, but it was the only way I could see to get her attention. I even told her that at best she had five years to live. At the time I said those words, I don't really think I was that optimistic. I, would have been surprised, I wouldn't have been surprised if she had died within a year. But she was not only in denial, she was in angry denial. I'll show you, she said, I'll prove you wrong. I am not dying. Her words were fierce, defiant, angry. It was time for me to leave. I'd done all I could. I left. I was not angry. I was sad, very sad. Now, to her credit, she was right up to a point. She did not die in five years. She proved resilient and survived another 10 years. But her last decade, though she was technically alive, was filled with pain, sickness, and despair. I'm not so sure her longer-term survival was a good thing. She never got better. She slowly and painfully deteriorated, and then she died. She, of course, is a church, a real church, a church in the Midwest, a church that was probably born out of vision, a church that died because she no longer had a vision. 
and stories from The Autopsy of a Church, which is a really excellent book that I'm going to ask my board to read because there are some really great ways in there that we can go about not letting that happen here. All right? So some of the common things that this author and this church consultant found when he was looking at churches that had died was that they'd made the past a hero. The most, the most pervasive and common thread of our autopsies was that, the, was that the deceased churches lived for a long time with the past as a hero. They held on more tightly with each progressive year. They often clung to things of the past with desperation and fear. Does that sound like anything in our own lives? You know, we, we talk about the good old days and we try to go back to where we were way back when. You know, and, and we try to make remembering the past a substitute for what we're doing right now. Oh, yeah, when I was in high school, I could run like the wind. You know, haven't gotten off this couch for, you know, several weeks, but boy, in high school, I could tear it up. The church refused to look like the community. For sure, there would be an occasional but faint attempt to reach the community. But essentially, on those rare occasions when they tried to reach out, the church members asked the community residents to come to them, to the church. They almost never made any effort to go to the community. I am really going to make an effort to get us as a church out into the community representing the church. You know, whether that's you just put on the purple T-shirt and you go volunteer someplace, or we actually have a team that comes together and, and does some work to help a school, a neighborhood, whatever it is. We have to let Birmingham know that we're here. Too often, churches die and nobody in the community notices. That's not going to happen here. So just a few examples of things that churches can do. These are other unity churches, some, bigger, some big and some small. Christ Church Unity in Orlando, my old church, has a Stop the Waste, Feed the Hungry program. And on average, they feed about 200 people a week. They have a lead for the team, and she collects food from restaurants and members of the church and then repurposes it. They pack it up in containers and hit the street in the church van. And they pass out meals uh, with Alice's Prosperity cards that, uh, that she has. The Unity Church in Pomona, uh, twice a month, they have a group that will understand and walk beside the mentally ill and homeless or near homeless. And uh, many from that group volunteer at local homeless shelters, bringing games, food, art, music, and conversation to those on the street. These are not things that require a lot of money, right? These are just, sim they simply require a commitment to, to getting out and making a difference in people's lives. Unity of Ames, Iowa, very, it's a small little uh, Unity Church led by one of my former roommates. Um, they do unity in the community, which they have implemented in several ways. We have several vegetable gardens, they call angel gardens, and the produce goes to uh, the Plant a Row for the Hungry program in Ames. We also started the Dream Seed Scholarship for kids aging out of foster care in partnership with the YSS agency in Ames. We support Good Neighbor, which provides food and rent support to needy people and we hold a food drive every July for another agency in Ames. So what they're doing is they're not having to, you know, reinvent the wheel. They're partnering with other organizations that are already doing good works in the city. And I think that's, that's some low-hanging fruit that we can probably jump on as well. I, I mean, for example, I, I volunteer and I bring things down to the Magic City Acceptance Center. Um, you know, it's just that, that's kind of a, a cause that appeals to me. So... I know we have a mission and a vision statement as this church, and those are things that, you know, say maybe in a year after we've done some more of the healing work that Reverend Beth suggested before I, I went overseas, after we've done some of the forgiveness work we're going to do starting next week, after we do some of the communications work we're going to do, um, I, I want us to take a look at maybe redoing our vision and our mission statement. But for the moment, I'd like for everyone to consider a new mission. And it goes like this. Transforming lives and inspiring people to make a difference in the world. Because I think Jesus called us to do exactly that. You know, when he said, pick up, your, you know, if you want to be my follower, pick up your cross daily and follow me, that's transformative. 
and inspiring people to make a difference in the world. You know, the, the thing that I know really changed my life and the thing that made the 12-step recovery program possible and, and really a spiritual boon was that piece of it where you've got to get out and help somebody else. People tried for thousands of years before that to heal people who were addicted in one way or another. And the one way that we found that works is when we reach out our hands and we help somebody else. When we help other people, we heal ourselves. And it works not only for us as individuals, but it'll work for us as a church, and it will work for us as a nation if we have the intestinal fortitude to see it through. Thank you very much.